Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Midwest Prairie Summer Service Co-op for 2021. As our congregations begin planning to reopen in-person gatherings this fall after our long pandemic separation, we take this opportunity for a series of virtual visits with some of our neighboring UU churches over the summer weeks. Each Sunday, you are invited to experience inspirational messages from a variety of our ministers, together with music and other elements that make our communities special. We hope that this morning's service will engage your thoughts and lift your spirits, giving you courage to make a difference in the world and helping to strengthen the connections that sustain us all. Hello, I am Reverend Dr. Kendall Gibbons, Senior Minister of All Souls Unitarian Universalist Church in Kansas City. We are delighted to be participating in this year's Summer Co-op Virtual Visit Series, and we thank all who helped to create today's service at All Souls. Special gratitude to Anthony Edwards, our Music Director and Worship Arts Coordinator, and to our faithful choir members for the music this morning. We are glad that you are with us today and hope that you enjoy your visit. Good morning and welcome to the second in our series of UU Summer Co-op Services here on the Midwest Prairie. Welcome to those from our participating congregations and fellowships. Welcome to those checking us out for the first time and to those checking back in after an absence. Welcome to those who have been on a long search and to those who landed here by accident. Welcome to those who are grateful for the safety of virtual gathering and to those who long to be back in person with their beloved communities. Welcome to young and old, queer and straight. Welcome to all colors and cultures, to all who diverge and all who conform to all who would prevent and repair harm, to all who seek healing for the human spirit and the web of creation. Here in these covenant communities of memory and promise, we gather to learn the love that redeems us from both loneliness in the heart and oppression in the world. We celebrate the interconnections that bind us to one another and to the life of all that is. We seek to practice gratitude, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly on the path of our journey together. May this hour of reflection and renewal lift our hearts and inspire us with new dedication to serve the highest good. May the sunshine, the soft breezes, and the green vibrancy of summer bring pleasure to our senses and joy to our souls. May the chalice flame that we kindle this morning call us together in peace and power, uniting us across our separate spaces to build again the beloved community of freedom, justice, mutuality, and beautiful change.
Now I invite you to light your personal chalice, and then we will join together in our opening hymn, Gather the Spirit. Watch where I go get the story in case you want to make it part of your work later. But obviously I can't do that today. I don't know what this is. Could be like a millipede maybe or an octopus. like this. Now I think 
we're ready to go. begin. So this tree represents Unitarian Universalism. This is the tree of our religion. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have seven branches. That reminds me of our seven promises. And the promises we make to each other to help us live in community. And so these branches have seeds and leaves on them, and those seeds and leaves are our promises. So our first promise is red. We promise to respect all people. And to help us remember this red promise, we like to think of everyone as a gift. So all people are a gift. We don't really know what's inside of them, but they're precious and special. And so we try to think of the red promise as a gift. So our next promise is orange. We promise to offer fair and kind treatment to all. Because if all people are a gift, then we want to treat them fair and kind. And this orange heart helps us remember to be kind. So red, orange, and yellow. Our next promise is yellow. We promise to yearn, to accept and learn about ourselves, others, and the mystery. Now, yearn is meaning to sort of wish or hope. And so we're hoping to learn and accept about ourselves in the mystery. And this flame helps us remember that sort of fire, that yearning. So red, orange, yellow, green. Green is our next promise. We promise to grow by exploring what is true and right in life. And so sometimes exploring what is true in life and growing is hard, but we ask questions and we learn, and we grow. And so we remember this green flower to help us remember growing. So next is blue. We promise to believe in our ideas and act on them. So in order to believe in our ideas and act on them, we have to listen to the little voice inside. And this bell helps us remember that. We also want to listen to other people's voices and what they tell us. And that's another part of the blue promise. So red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo. Now indigo is a special dark blue. And our indigo promise is insist on a peaceful, fair, and free world for all. There's a lot to that one. It means we try to do what is right. We want freedom and justice for everyone. And justice means to be fair to everyone. And peace means to live in harmony. And symbol for peace is often a dove, which is a bird. And so our symbol to remind our indigo promise is this dark blue bird. And so our seventh principle is violet, which is sort of a light purple. And that promise is value our home earth that we share with all living creatures. So just as we respect all people, we want to respect all the creatures on earth. And to remember that, we have this violet globe or world. So red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet are seven promises that we make to each other to live in the community of Unitarian Universalism. But our promises have grown because they have the roots feeding us, and down there are our roots. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six. We have six roots feeding us, and our roots are our sources. Now, our first source is wonder and awe, and the symbol for that is this star with a spiral in it. I think it goes that way. So I'm going to put that down there. Our beliefs come from our sense of wonder. We learn by asking why. Our next source is people's story, and our symbol is this person with a little heart. 
Our beliefs come from the people of long ago and today whose lives are mirroring us to be fine remind us to be kind and fair. Oh look, it's our kind heart. We learn by hearing their stories. So now our third is world religions. So we have lots of symbols for world religions. Maybe later you can look at this closely. These are symbols of various religions around the world. And our beliefs on how to live together come from all the world's religions. We learn from many cultures. So our next source has a Jewish star and a Christian cart, a Christian cross in a heart. Because Unitarian Universalism came originally from Christianity, which came from Judaism. And our beliefs come from the Jewish and Christian teachings that tell us to love all others as we love ourselves. We learn from our past history, and so that's why we have a heart on this one. One, two, three, four, five. So our fifth is reason and science. And our symbol for that, I think this is an atom, it comes from science. Our beliefs come from the use of reason and the discoveries of science. We learn by using our minds. And our last source is nature and the cycles of life. And the symbol for that is this plant with some grass. Our beliefs come from the harmony of nature and the sacred circle of life. We learn by knowing we are part of nature and the cycles of life. So there's our six sources and our seven promises. Our promises come from our sources and what we learn from their stories, but it also comes from something else. In spirit play, that something else is the spirit of love and mystery that some people call God. And in spirit play, we represent that with a circle of sparkly or shiny gold. So our sources come from the spirit of love and mystery that some people call God. I'm gonna put that down there. So all of our sources, our roots of our tree of Unitarian Universalism, feed our branches. I wonder, I wonder if you have ever heard any of this before. I wonder which of these you like best. I wonder if any of the promises are more important than the others. I wonder if any of the sources are more important than the others. So watch how I put the story away. In case you make it part of your work, you'll know how to prepare it for someone else. So first I'm going to start with my sources. I'm going to put together, put away nature and science and reason and Judeo-Christian and world religions, people's stories and wonder and awe. I'm going to also put away the sparkly circle that represents the spirit of love and mystery that some people call God. Next, I'm going to put away our promises. I think I'm going to go in order. So I'm going to put away red we promise to respect all people. And orange, offer fair and kind treatment to all. And yellow, we promise to yearn and accept and learn about ourselves, others, and the mystery. Green, we promise to grow by exploring what is true and right in life. Blue, we promise to believe in our ideas and act on them. Indigo, for insist on a peaceful, 
fair and free world for all. And the violet, we value our home, earth that we share. And we put away our symbol of Unitarian Universalism, our flaming chalice. And I'm going to fold up our tree very carefully. Tuck in all the roots. Hard to fold that, isn't it? All right, nestles right in here. And then I'm going to fold up our underlay. And I'll go put it on the story so you know where to find it. Choose to Bless the World, a responsive reading from the writings of Rebecca Parker. Your gifts, whatever you discover them to be, can be used to bless or curse the world. The, the mind's power, the strength of the hands, the reaches of the heart, the gift of speaking, listening, imagining, seeing, waiting, any of these can serve to feed the hungry, bind up wounds, welcome the stranger, praise what is sacred, do the work of justice, or offer love. Any of these can draw down the prison door, pour red, abandon the poor, obscure what is holy, comply with injustice, or withhold love. You must answer this question. What will you do with your gifts? Choose to bless the world. The choice to bless the world can take you into solitude to search for the sources of power and grace, native wisdom, healing, and liberation. More, the choice will draw you into community the endeavor shared, the heritage passed on, the companionship of struggle, the importance of keeping faith, the life of ritual and praise, the comfort of human friendship, the company of earth, its course of life welcoming you. None of us alone can save the world. Together, that is another possibility waiting. Good morning. My name is Russell Feldhausen. I'm a member of All Souls, and I currently serve as the Vice President of our Board of Trustees. Our board has recently been discussing the topic of stewardship, and we spent quite a bit of time discussing what the word stewardship actually means. As it turns out, that word can have many different connotations and meanings for different people. For me, good stewardship is about caring for the church and the larger community, making sure they both have the resources needed to do the good work and be the change that we all wish to see in the world. Many of us choose to support that mission by making donations of our time, our talents, and our treasures. We give away some of our limited resources in the hope that all of those little gifts can be combined together to become something greater. As we hopefully start to leave the world of the pandemic behind and look ahead toward what our new normal is, we should all take a moment to stop and reflect about what we want that new normal to be and how we can achieve it. The answer may be different for all of us, and that's fine. That's the beauty of all of this. We can each individually assess our own available resources and our desired outcomes, and determine what would be the best option for us. You may have time to help cook and serve meals for those who need it. You may have the talent to help build a website or create a beautiful garden for everyone to dwell in peace with nature. Or you may have treasure beyond your own needs and choose to give some of that money to support the causes that matter most to you. Today, I ask you to think about the world as you wish it could be and what resources you have that could be given in support of that vision. Your support of both your time, your talents, and your treasure are all crucial toward the work of our UU communities building a better world. The offering will now be given and gratefully received. At the Unitarian Church of Lincoln, we have a big vision. 
We aspire to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and the world. Each week on Sunday, we take up a collection to support the work of our church. If you'd like to consider a contribution today, you can click the donate button in the footer of the website, www.unitarianlincoln.org, or you can give via text giving. Simply text UC Lincoln and the amount to 73256. Here in reverence now we gather For the blessings we have known With a pledge to one another That we journey not alone Joy and sorrow Let's say together the words of dedication for our offering. We dedicate our offerings and our actions to the mission at the heart of this congregation, to build a respectful, caring community, 
to inspire personal and spiritual growth and to create change toward a just and compassionate society. Good morning. UU Minister Gretchen Haley wrote today's reading for our current times, especially for those of us who aren't yet gathering in person, but thinking about it. Calling together. We gather once again around computer screens and in pajamas. What was once clumsy and confusing has now become routine. A homemade holiness we conjure together with clicks and cameras. We create here community, connection, comfort, and we find here the courage to continue week after week, hour upon hour. But it's a time no less real than our ancestors made in their gathering of ceremony, collections of joy and sorrow for centuries before, when bodies shared space as if obvious and inerrant and eye contact, at once awkward and anchoring, was as abundant as the voices lifted in shared song. Think of when our chalice was lit. The smell of the match lingered just a moment and was ours together. Do you remember? Yet we too mark time. Even in this, our time out of time, this liminal space, and we too hold each other, walk together, discern the ways of love, and we give thanks for this day, never again taking our inhale and exhale of breath for granted. We hold space still for mystery and for the chance just to begin again. In these days of remembering ourselves and the gifts and griefs of life unmediated by screens and mute buttons. These days when we know once again, sounds of spontaneous sneezes, children shrieking with joy, the small talk, the sweat, the surprise of seeing strangers. In these days of re-entry, let us begin to stitch together our worlds. These remnants of our embodied past necessarily set aside for our survival and are still lingering present where life remains fragile and we declare everyone equally worthy, called by name, beloved. So into this steadfast hour of slowing down and stirring up, let us say we've been changed and let us say we're not yet done with our changes. Let us weave it all into the dark and possible future and know the wholeness and the brokenness is a blessing. Dear friends, long time and brand new, visitors and seekers all, come for these few more weeks of virtual community. Let us gather at our altar screens and let us worship together. Good morning. My name is Scott England, and I'm a member of All Souls and a member of the All Souls Board. One of our readings this morning is by Brian Wren. We are not our own. We are not our own. Earth forms us. Human leaves on nature's growing vine, fruit of many generations, seeds of life divine. We are not alone. Earth names us, past and present, peoples near and far, family and friends and strangers show us who we are. Therefore, let us make thanksgiving and with justice willing and aware, give to earth and all things living liturgies of care. Let us be a house of welcome, living stone upon living stone, gladly showing all our neighbors we are not our own.
At one point during the past year, this post appeared on my Facebook feed. Hello, all, it said. My family and I are looking for a new church. We are hoping to find one that is inclusive and diverse, particularly toward LGBTQ+, immigrants, and multiracial families. Exceptional music and children and youth programs are also important to us. It would be a bonus if there is a choir, band, orchestra, and or if it is within 20 minutes of our home. I'm starting to believe that we are hunting for a unicorn church. Do you all have any recommendations? I find it sad that such a church should be considered a rare thing. What this family is seeking is what many progressive congregations, including pretty much all UU churches, hope to offer. Diversity, inclusivity, LGBTQ plus immigrant and multiracial friendly, with exceptional music and programs for children and youth. Such a religious community is something that I continue to believe many American families would value if they were confident that it actually existed and that they could find it. The original post does not specify whether the family searching for this church home is composed of or includes people of color, but they are looking for diversity in their religious community, a criterion which makes sense to me. We are more likely to grow in an environment which includes other people who are not just like us. Still, we have to be comfortable enough that we are willing to take the risks that lead to growth, which means that it is hard for new people to stick in a congregation where they are the only anything, whether that be person of color, transgender kid, unhoused, ex-offender, undocumented person, single parent, wheelchair user, under 30, over 50, whatever. I wish that I knew some kind of programmatic answer to this dilemma. Every minister colleague I know wishes that. The line between self-involved and neglectful, leaving first-time visitors to fend for themselves and feel ignored, and the kind of fawning, creepy overwelcome that leaves them feeling singled out and stalked is faint and infinitely permeable. Finding the right balance on a case-by-case -case basis is a kind of uncommon relational talent. There is no formula, only a sensitivity to subtle cues, discerning when to be forthcoming and when to back off, when to share your own excitement, and when to listen for what someone else is seeking, when to probe for information to connect to, and when to respect the desire for anonymity in the moment. There are logistical courtesies that we can practice, making sure that both our real life and virtual signage is accurate so people know how to access what we offer. Remembering that although those who have been around for a while may already know this stuff, every week is Visitor Sunday and someone new is trying to figure out what it's all about for the first time. We can eliminate barriers in our buildings and in our cultural assumptions so that we don't embarrass people with intrusive assumptions that they work, that they are married, that they can climb steps, that they go to school, that they have a standard address or constant internet access. We can learn to ask for and use preferred pronouns, for instance. 
There is, in other words, a sensible baseline that we need not fall below in our welcome. But that alone does not inevitably make us a house of welcome to people different from ourselves. What then are we to do? I want to suggest two systemic rather than strategic goals that I suspect would have the happy side effect of increasing our congregation's appeal to random visitors and church shoppers. I have always believed that people who work together in the service of a goal larger than themselves become connected. It's all but inevitable. Even when they are not necessarily happy about it, that kind of common project creates a rueful set of shared memories. Trust me, in 20 years or so, when a generation has risen for whom COVID-19 is as much of an abstract anachronism as the Spanish influenza of 1918, you and I are going to be buying t-shirts proclaiming, I survived the pandemic of 2020. And no one who didn't share this past year will be able to join that particular historical club. So shared suffering will do it, but for my preference, shared aspiration is better. Everything that we do to serve our larger civic environment and create change in our society draws us into the fabric of community, both with one another and with people outside our group. Spend an hour putting together ham and cheese sandwiches next to someone and you will have a new acquaintance. Do that every week for a year and you will know something about that person's life, their circumstances and dreams and worries, and they will know something about you. They will miss you if you are not there and be concerned. When you read a Facebook post about people who are hungry being fed, you will want to share that recognition with them. You will be pleased for them when their first grandchild is born or when they get a new job. The soft filaments of community will begin to weave. All of which is good and needful, but take it one step further. Go hand out those sandwiches at a picnic for the houseless and food insecure for several weeks. Don't bring an agenda, just show up and let your attention be drawn to the people you see. Some of them will be volunteers like yourself, maybe from the local Methodist congregation or the downtown Episcopal Cathedral you will start to figure out who our allies are out there with the food. Maybe people from traditions or communities you didn't think would care about these things. Other people you meet will be those you are there to serve. Some of them may be crazy, some of them tragic, some of them living such a different reality from yours that it seems like there is no way to connect. And so the first thing you learn is to suspend judgment. Then some will be touchingly kind to each other and embarrassingly grateful to you. Some will be cheerful and funny and patient in incredibly challenging circumstances and you will start to realize that it is not all about you helping them. Then the headlines will have faces and their anger in confronting harmful policy decisions will make sense to you and become yours. And another kind of community will put out tendrils and begin to grow. Or, Go to the Spanish-English Immersion Grade School and help an eight-year-old student discover the skill and joy of reading and see the relief in her overworked teacher's eyes. Suddenly, 
The threat of ICE deportation raids here in our city will be personal about her and her parents. Or come and keep vigil in our own church lobby some frigid winter night while exhausted people who have nowhere else to go feel the blood flow back into their fingers and toes and knowing that they will not lose them this night at least nod off into a moment of relative safety and warmth. I predict you will read the pronouncements of the city council members with different eyes after a couple of those nights. Or if you prefer, join the demonstrators down at Town Hall Park and elsewhere. Listen to the organizers and the speakers. Tell stories of what it is like to grow up Asian American in your town. Or try to feed a family of eight a family on $8 an hour, or to bury your black son after a run-in with the police, or to greet him after more than 20 years in prison for a crime he clearly did not commit. Go again the next time it happens, and the next, and the time after that, and start to recognize the same people after a while, Start to ask why the same tragedies keep happening. Or go attend the city council meetings themselves and watch millionaire developers plead that they need tax abatements for their multi-million dollar project while our neighborhood sidewalks crumble and our school teachers buy their own supplies out of their own meager paychecks. Do not, if you can possibly help it, do these things alone. Take somebody with you so that you can remind each other of why you came and what you learned. Take someone from your congregation and talk about what you believe in and what you might be called to do about it and what it feels like to see your values become a little bit more real in the world. And when you meet a visitor at church on Sunday morning, by all means, invite them to sit with you or chat on Zoom sometime. Invite them to lunch after church, either there or at your favorite brunch spot, or offer to deliver their Sunday plus meal. But add something like, I'm part of a group that makes sandwiches to give away on Thursday evenings. I would love to have you join us. Or I'm going to a voting rights rally next Saturday. Would you like to come? Because here's the point. Even if they can't or it's not their thing, it tells them something about what matters around here. It demonstrates that we have a focus beyond ourselves and our own comfort even if we are, as has been said of our congregation anyway, primarily a white space and always have been. Maybe we won't always be, but I would rather be a community of integrity and service and authentic goodwill than a congregation anxious to decorate itself with diversity while avoiding being transformed by real relationships. That's the unicorn church, the one that really wants to grow and change in beloved community, not just grow so that it can stay comfortably the same. The other systemic quality that would serve us well, in addition to being good public relations, is joyful generosity. I will never forget the person who once told a new members orientation group that he felt he had to try attending a particular congregation because he was driving by one time and everyone looked so happy as they were coming out of the service. As Maya Angelou has told us, people will forget what you said People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. 
We are, of course, going to rejoice greatly when it is safe for us to gather in person again. But, you know, eventually the thrill is bound to wear off and we will start to take it for granted again and get testy about the dozens of little human annoyances that are always present whenever people have to deal with other people. Now, I'm not suggesting that we all go around with big fake smiles plastered on our faces at all times. I've seen communities like that and they are creepy. There is plenty to be genuinely angry and sad about in the world after all. But I wonder if we can save just a little portion of that great celebration and gratitude of being reunited after all these months of separation and step back into it whenever we find ourselves challenged by the stress of change or the irritation of other folks' deficiencies. Can we remember what it was like when our hugs were risky and our singing was dangerous? Can we stay in touch with what a blessing it is to gather in person and breathe the same air without making each other sick? Can we remind ourselves to cherish the joyful gift of community, even as we confront the work and the friction of it? That is the Unicorn Congregation, the one that stays connected to both inner joy and outreach beyond itself. The one whose members are generous and faithful in their support because they feel themselves and each other changing and growing into the people they know they could be and into the beloved community where each living stone upholds and supports the others to create a true house of welcome, where people and earth and all things living receive the liturgies of care that heal and bless. One great teacher almost 2,000 years ago said that we didn't have to search for it or wait for it, that community, said it was already here right now within us and among us if we just knew how to look, said it was the poor and the downtrodden and the hungry and the grieving who knew it best, said privilege was the exact thing that you had to let go of to get there at last. People have built a lot of fancy churches over those lessons down the centuries, but rare are the ones who take him at his word then or now. There is no perfect church, of course. Unicorns are mythical creatures after all. And congregations are full of all too real, all too flawed people and ministers. But it is real, flawed people who actually build communities and then reach beyond themselves for a vision of greater justice and more abundant compassion and more transformative love. It is real people building actual communities who share hardships and rejoicing together, who become a house of welcome, who make a promise to each other to endure the risks of change together in order to serve a higher purpose. Like young Lydia Grace, they take the bent cake pans and cracked teapots of this broken world and plant the seeds of beauty and new life in scraped together soil so that we all might have flowers along with our bread. The world calls to us from the grip of violence, fear, and old injustice renewed in destructive power. It calls us to be seekers of truth and servants of hope to bear witness to the wrong that has been and to the good that might yet be. 
And when we open our hearts, we find that we are not alone because we are not our own, but one another's, which is what we have been supposed to learn all along, I'm thinking. Let's sing it together. Here, may the silken fibers of interdependence weave the bonds of beloved community thoroughly into our hearts and spirits. Here, may the liturgies of care redeem all tragedy into compassion and all suffering into righteous peace. Here, let us make thanksgiving and connection that we may be a glad and generous people who live in belonging to the earth, to our neighbors, and to each other. So be it. Be ours a religion which like sunshine goes everywhere its temple space, its shrine the good heart, its creed all truth, its ritual words of love. We extinguish this flame but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fires of commitment. For all these we carry in our minds and hearts until the time shall come when we will be together again. Thank you for being with us and helping to weave the web of connection this morning. I hope you will join us again next Sunday morning for another of our summer co-op services when the Rev Reverend John Alou Johnstone of Manhattan, Kansas will reflect on the season of endings and beginnings. Take care, be safe, and have a great week, everyone.